Welcome everybody to our supporters fund, Ask an Angel. And today we're very excited to have Tim Ayer, an investor in early stage companies, join us. Uh, very exciting, I've known Tim for uh, feels like years, but it's probably only been maybe just over, uh, maybe over a year, year and a half. Uh, but it's been fantastic uh, working with you, Tim, and, and learning lots from you. So uh, we're going to jump right into it. And um, yeah, we won't slow down. This is uh, right to it. So, okay. So first question we want to ask you is, why do you invest in startup companies? Uh, yeah, great question to start with. So, um, you know, why, why do I invest in startup companies? I, I look at it more as I'm investing in people. Um, obviously, I'm in it to, to make money at the end of the day, right? Um, but uh, I, I view it as a mix of um, backing good folks that I want to see succeed and, uh, you know, hiring someone to do an important job and, uh, you know, somewhere in between. Oh, that's great. And it, it makes complete sense that at the end, you're, you're investing in people, right? And people grow businesses. And the best way to get behind those people is to be able to help fund and, and move them forward in, in any direction. Uh, that they're going to take that business. Uh, how did you get? How did you get started in investing into startups? Right. So how I got started in investing in startups was um, I don't know. It was a bit of a, a bit of a fluke. I, I've done a whole bunch of other types of investments, like domain name investing. Um, but how how I got hooked into it was a, a simple Facebook post from an ex colleague that they shared with me in like 2017 um, about a friend of theirs that was doing an equity crowdfund campaign. Um, in the U.S. And so, you know, I, I dove into it. I put a little bit of money. Then I'm like, what is this all about? And I started to do more research. Um, and, and that led to a progression. I, I started reaching out to people on LinkedIn that I'd been connected with for a few years that, you know, I, I consider to be a little bit of a, a rainmaker, right? So, you know, they're able to, to pull it off, grow a company and exit. And they're working on a new project I would inquire in it. You know, the chat would turn into you know, they happen to be doing a fundraise. And so I would jump on board. Um, then, then what happened is I'd layer on another tactic and uh, looking for startups because, you know, one of the equity crowdfund companies ended up going through Alchemist Accelerator program um, out of California. And so then I started to, well, I watched their demo day and then I looked at the other startups that were going through it and I ended up investing in another company that went through that demo day. So then I started to just make it a habit of the top accelerator programs, uh, attending their demo days and starting conversations. And um, some of them have led to investments, other just, you know, good contacts. And then uh, on top of that, layered on uh, frequenting events like, like OPNs and uh, the supporters fund uh, pitch it events. And, um, you know, that's kind of rounded me out and I think uh, all those avenues kind of stuck, but you know, it was originally just a, a Facebook share that someone did supporting uh, a startup that they believed in, right? That's amazing. So when you think about it, does your background being in business development, uh, corporate development, and being able to work with a lot of different groups, do you think that really helped carry you through this because it, you have an inquisitive mind. So you were like, hey man, this seems cool. I should dive into this. But maybe if you were in a different profession, you may not have had that same experience or desire to grow into that space. Yeah, I, I think so. I think um, it's a combination of things. My, my background has always been more analytical. I, I actually started off as a corporate investigator before I got into doing uh, e-commerce. And so, you know, digging in, doing research into companies, um, even like trying to be a good judge of character as best I can on, you know, who would be uh, most successful, all kind of play a part, right? So you gotta, you gotta, as, as an investor, you have to use the tools at your disposal, right? Your own skill set, and, and and bring it forward. And where you have gaps, look at ways that you can enhance that. Whether that's looking for companies that have been pre-vetted by people that bring a different perspective, right? No, that's a great point. And, and having a different perspective in investing is uh, a great way to to keep the ball moving forward, especially when there's a lot of companies out there. If you're not getting feedback all around, you're gonna find yourself. Uh, kind of falling behind and not really understanding the direction of a company or why they're going the direction that they should be. Uh, so you can add in a lot of insight there. So that's, that's fantastic. Um, so what is your favorite part of investing? It's such a broad uh, category. So yeah, um, there, there's a lot, there's a lot there. I, I would say my favorite part of investing is, is seeing how the leaders grow their companies over the years. Um, you know, hitting a lot of amazing milestones 
but also seeing how they grow themselves, uh, right, by making those tough decisions uh, that they need to make. And, you know, it could be, you know, we're seeing a lot of startups make pivots because of what's going on with, with COVID-19 and the impact. So, you know, whether making that decision to, to shift gears and make that pivot, or, you know, some, sometimes uh, a founder has to make a, a tough decision in part ways with, with a co-founder early on. And so, you know, it's, it's, it's a lot of those types of moments that shape who they are in their company. And then it's exciting to watch and be part of that journey. For sure. So it's, it's kind of like a, a live sporting event. You get to see all the action going on and decide how long you're going to stay and watch and, and where you're going to jump in and help out. So I think that's, uh, that's a great piece to um, what makes you uh, an investor. Um, how many companies do you look to invest in per year? Uh, right. So, you know, since 2017, I've done about three to four investments per year. Uh, I, I usually do it around the, the Q1, Q2 uh, timeframe. Um, also mentioned like check sizes. I, I generally do about 10, 25 or 50 K um, depending on the situation. Okay. No, that's, uh, that's great insights. And, and if people want to know that, right? When they're looking and reaching out to you, they want to know that because you're you're keeping yourself in this precise um, format that they have a good chance of getting one-on-one -on -one support and growth with you and i can tell you that from the companies that you have invested in they're all awesome so uh you're doing a great job on that side um any verticals that you like to focus on inside of this package that you're putting together yeah so in terms of verticals i like to focus on um you know from 2017 2018 i was primarily focused on investing in the future of work and so that was remote work tools hr tech uh even some gig economy you know as a as a self-employed uh remote worker it just made logical sense for me to use that as a starting point you know and invest in what you know um, and, and timing worked out because some of my bigger investments uh, greatly accelerated because of COVID-19. Uh, mandating that people uh, work remote, obviously, has, has really helped out uh, a lot of those startups. Um, and then in 2019, 2020, I started to diversify into other areas. So I no longer consider myself just focused on in one particular vertical. Um, I, it's my job to always be learning, right, to, to research and to, and to uh, get comfortable with uh, getting into other verticals. No, that's great. And, and um, as, a, as a position of investing in what you know, I think that's for any investor that comes in early stage investing, that's probably the best spot and where most will go to and gravitate to. Uh, and that's a good thing. Um, and then as you get a little bit more comfortable with term sheets and sure. the startups and the, the CEOs uh, jumping in as a generalist, um, I find is that uh, you start to pull at different areas and you get more excited because you start to see that there's a gap because of, again, the reading, the insights, the events you attend. So uh, that's really, uh, really fascinating on, on how you've tied that all together. So do you have a due diligence requirements that you look for before you make a commitment? Um, like what is, and what is your timelines for those invest investments? Yeah. It, so in terms of due diligence requirements, um, you know, some investments, if I'm really comfortable um, in that area, it, it could be a 10 minute phone call and I've already made my decision. Um, but uh, other ones where I am learning and I do need to uh, apply like, you know, some research to, it, it can take like two to three months. And, um, you know, that's to be fair, uh, to, to, to give you an idea and invest in the company um, just the other month, uh, like in, in April and, um, I had conversations with the, the company going back until last October, uh, you know, and it was just, it was just the point of lining it up and making sure that, you know, there was growth there because it was a new area for me to understand. I need, I need to see that traction as opposed to me having the, the foresight to understand that it would take off. Right. Um, so, you know, it's important to, to understand what, what companies are working on that it, that is something that is needed and it can produce the desired outcome. But also, you know, to, to validate that they're the ones for the job. It could be because it's, it's, it's the co-founders, it's the team that needs to pull it off. And um, anyone can have a great idea, right? I mean, uh, they, they think it might be theirs, their, but there could be like thousands of other people that had the same thought and they're, they're trying to action it. And it's, it's whether or not they're the ones that can pull it off. You're, uh, you made a good point where 
you know, that if it's that team that's going to be the ones to be able to do it. And I know in some of uh, the investments we've made, we followed companies for two years before uh, we made an investment because one, we loved what they were doing, but we also had this um, love hate relationship for their business, their model, but we really liked the CEO. And I think where things start to shift is that as that CEO grows in their position of that new company, it starts to open up more doors, but it also lets us see if they're focused, if they're really driven and they're the ones to take that job on. So I think that's a, a really valid point is that you don't always have to jump and go. You've got your 10 minute, uh, I'm comfortable, love what you guys are doing. But then there's also the two, three months where you're taking a little bit more time, doing a lot more due diligence. If it's the paper side or the business people side, you're really investigating a lot more. So uh, that's a, a very uh, telling tale of uh, learning as you go as an investor. That's, that's awesome. Uh, so outside of your, your DD requirements, and we talked a little bit about this, which is the CEO, the team, uh, what are those other factors that really draw you into the business? Yeah, so uh, about the, the team and CEO, I, uh, I think I'm, I mentioned before, I look at it as kind of, I'm, I'm hiring someone to do an important job, right? So that when, when you're going about it that way, the best, the best predictor for future behavior is past behavior. And so, you know, the founders are critical as well as the talent that they surround themselves with. If the founders had not grown a company to exit before, that's not a, that's not a deal breaker. Um, but, you know, obviously I'll dig into their work history to look to see, you know, whether they have deep domain experience or it could be they just have a mix of determination and transferable skills. And, you know, they could still pull it off, uh, right? Um, so I, I think primarily that's what I look for. I, I look for the, the team and, the, and look at the founders and, and um, make sure they're the right ones to do it. So when you're looking at this team, is there uh, different pieces to the board, to their, um, uh, their core team? Because some of these, uh, and the way I kind of shape it is that when I look at a team, a lot, of the, a lot of the people are there because they're early stage grinders. They really get this business off the ground, uh, but that's what they live off. That's the energy that they take. So there's a point where they have to leave the business. The right. CEO and some senior people will be there for a long term. So are you looking at how that core team is put together and what the longevity of that team is, or is it just focused strictly on that CEO and how they can manage their, their team? So I, I look at a, a combination of things. It's, it's not just the, the founders, co-founders. Uh, you know, as you mentioned, um, you know, there might be a, a point where they need to exit. And um, so it's, it's who they surround themselves with. So you know, if, they, if they're bringing people on board that um, have more experience working for a large organization, and um, you know, they've, maybe they've, they've come in at, uh, a different stage in the evolution of a business and can provide a different perspective. And maybe, you know, at some point they hand over the reins to them to, to take over. Right. So I look at the advisory board as well, right. The, um, who they're, who they're surrounding themselves with that can help uh, transition it over versus um, them looking outside and, and bringing some uh, additional talent to the mix um, too early on. No, that's a good point. And uh, I like that. That's very good. Uh, on the, um, on the raise side, when the companies do go to raise, uh, do you look at being the lead? So in terms of leading rounds, um, I have not yet done that. Uh, you know, my, my, my check size is, is, you know, 10, 25, 50K. So I haven't gotten a position where it, it felt like I, I needed to make that kind of jump and be a lead. Maybe in the future, uh, things will change. Um, you know, one thing I try to do, though, is add value. So even though I'm not, you know, leading things, I encourage friends, family, acquaintances to also back. And um, some instances that, that brings in an extra twenty five thousand um, dollars into the startup. And so I've, I've done that on a, uh, maybe about three to four different occasions. That's amazing. Tim, this is why you're an investor, because you help startups grow and you help them find money. That's amazing. That is sick. Uh, I think that's perfect. A lot of people should look at doing that when they help startups, man. That's great. Um, so do you have any, uh, while you're going through this process, you've kind of yeah. found some startups, you're kind of going through the stages, you've gone through due diligence, you're going to make an investment. Uh, you've started to down that path. Are there any preferred terms that you like? So in terms of, um, you know, preferred terms for investing, uh, generally, um, I get into companies when they're around the, the four to six uh, million valuation range. 
Um, I have made exceptions. Uh, you know, I've, I've done really early stage at a, at a million dollar type of pre-seed. Um, others I've jumped in as far as uh, $10 million just because um, they had the growth and traction and um, it made sense, but typically I stick to that four to six. Um, you know, it, it's a mix. Uh, I, I tend to go with, at this stage, uh, as an angel investor, I tend to go more with what they, the founder set forth as the, the investment tool that they use, right? So um, I, I do have some convertible notes, but uh, you know, a good portion are safes because a lot of startups are operating that way, especially in that type of valuation range. Okay, no, that's good to know. And uh, having a mix and being able to work through those different variables is good. And uh, sometimes when you start to uh, go increase that value, that you are putting in, uh, you start to change a bit of the terms to fit more around what you're looking for as well, especially if you're gonna spend more time helping them grow the business. Uh, sometimes that's uh, favorable on your side as well, uh, but that's, that's great to know. Uh, in your investments, have you uh, looked at or set aside any follow-on investment? So in terms of doing follow-up in investments in, in startups, um, yeah, I have increased uh, investments in founders and um, generally that's when I see results to, to justify that. And, um, you know, I, I got, uh, I'm sure every investor you talk to has a, a similar story, but, you know, I got, I got burned doubling down on a, on a company um, too early on and, and things didn't work out. So now I'm a little bit more, um, you know, I, I de-risk a little bit and I look at it in terms of I put in a bit of money and then if I see that they're going the, the right trajectory, uh, then I put in more. Um, and, you know, that could be an increase in uh, monthly recurring revenue. It could be an increase in user stats, whatever are the key metrics um, for that company. And I, I would say about a third of my portfolio um, I've done full on investments in. And um, I like to, I like to stay close to founders after I, after I make the initial investment, because then I have the opportunity to jump in and put more dollars in. And, you know, if I'm, if I'm seeing the stats increase and they're, they want to extend out their runway um, before they change up their revenue model, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't consider that a big risk. So I'll, I'll put money in at that point and, and generally they'll hold the same sort of valuation or it will be slightly higher than what I put in my initial investment. So that's why I think it's important as an investor, as an angel investor to stay close and to, and to try to add additional value because then you have these kind of opportunities to, to do those follow-on investments. No, that's uh, that's a great advice to, to stay close. And uh, in today's market, everybody's doing a lot of things to keep everything afloat and moving around. So any extra added value you can bring to a startup is always going to be um, well received. So you mentioned uh, a couple of, uh, of different forms of how you make investments and follow ons. The other kind of big piece to this is do you take board seats and is that of an interest at this point in time? Taking board seats, uh, if I'm offered, um, you know, I, I, I am on two advisory boards where, where founders um, offered me some reduced value caps or discounts or other type of incentives um, when I was investing to, to commit more time. And, you know, certainly this is something that I have a keen interest in exploring further in the future. Okay. No, and that's, uh, that's good to know. I, I think um, when you're a domain expert, as you mentioned earlier on, people tend to gravitate to that and, and they want to make sure that they have that initial uh, really early uh, investor that comes in that can help them through the first two years. And it's a good thing to, to have that domain expert on the panel because it brings a lot of uh, legitimacy to the actual startup. So right. uh, that's great to, to hear and know. Uh, what other ways do you look to help startups outside of money? And money is fine as well, but what other things? You've talked about a few pieces being staying close, what other things do you do that you really think help benefit them? Yeah, there, there's a lot of um, simple ways to help startups outside of money. And one of them is share their damn social posts. Um, so, you know, I, I, don't, I don't see this being done enough by investors. Like certainly you want the startup that you're backing to get more leads, to get more awareness. Share it when, they, when they're posting something that might be relevant to your network. Um, you know, the, the simple stuff is often overlooked. Um, but, you know, re really, though, I try to help out where I can. Um, this could be whether I, I know someone that might be a, a good user, um, if it's a, you know, a B2B type service or um, even B2C partners, other investors, uh, anything I can. I, I mean, if, if a founder shows that they have hustle, 
uh, I'll show the same, right? So I want them to be successful. I, it helps me out. So a little bit, a little selfish there, but you know, you, you want them to grow and that, that's the whole point. So I should do anything you can. Well, it's interesting you say that because uh, the other day I was um, having a discussion and I actually brought that up um, about this point you just mentioned. And I think it's, uh, it's another uh, fantastic thing that you do to support your startups is that you post on a regular basis information that they have posted or information you've created to support the startup. And again, I think that is absolutely fantastic. I think more investors need to do this. Um, you've put your money into a company that you can help grow and shift. This isn't putting money into Apple where they don't know who you are. Uh, right. these companies have to lean on that. And I think that that is such a huge benefit uh, to early stage companies and kudos to you for that. That's uh, that's fantastic. Uh, when you've uh, now you've gone through this life cycle, you're now promoting and you're pushing these companies out. How do you look at uh, the CEOs or the people in the business? How do you want them to communicate back to you? Is there a preferred choice um, so that you can stay in the loop and you can help solve problems? Is there something that you choose to do quarterly, weekly, monthly? Is there something that you get them used to at the beginning? Yeah, so company communication um, to their investors is, is something that's important. And it needs to be done. And I, you know, I've seen the full spectrum of things. Uh, you know, I, 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 I prefer monthly that that's it. Uh, you know, the, the spectrum that I've seen is, you know, I, I've invested in companies that they ghosted me afterwards and, you know, I might, I might get an update every year, right. Or every year and a half or something like that. Um, and, you know, some reach out when they've done a successful, uh, successful round. And, you know, that's good news to have, but, you know, I'd still like to understand what's going on um, in the business as they kind of grow and get to that stage. Right. Um, and uh, even one in my portfolio, they go as far as to have weekly updates with metrics that they post for anyone to see because their culture is about full transparency. But, um, you know, if it's a, if it's a monthly update that the best I've seen is just keep it as a roundup key metrics um, the battles, the wins, and then the asks, right? So that's good. And I agree that you need to have some form of communication back because sometimes when you post questions, problems, uh, that might trigger an investor to say, Hey, I can help solve that. Reach out to a manufacturer, reach out to anybody uh, and bring that conversation in. And sometimes it's just that one ask. If you're uh, doing the buckshot spray, which is I'm asking a million problems, it doesn't allow someone to pertain to that one problem. Yeah. So if they're sharing a couple of points, you're interested because that's your investment and you start to pick up those little things, those little things can get solved quicker because investors tend to want to help their investment. Uh, especially yeah, and, in the and you, you know, if you're, if you're looking to get follow on type of investments out of your, out of your network, um, you want to keep them informed. If you reach out of, out of nowhere and you're like, Hey, you know what? I need money and you have nothing to show for it, you haven't continued to build that rapport, you're going to find it very difficult. And you're going to have to keep on even to get referrals at that point. And you're going to have to go out to the well and try to find new networks of investors. It's interesting that you say that one of, uh, one of the um, uh, parts to reaching out and keeping your investors informed is that investors also talk amongst themselves. So there's a lot of times and it's, it's interesting, I'll hear of an investor who's invested in a company, but they're not getting any feedback from that company. They're not hearing anything. They're not getting in communication. So they're sitting on the side, bad mouthing them saying, these guys won't do this. They won't do that. And then when this company comes to the market, the interest level from other investors who have been hearing this from obviously an investor that's dissatisfied, it carries a long way. So I think that's something that we have to uh, keep in mind as a startup is that you have to keep that communication trail going so that everybody collaborates and, and helps grow. Yeah. So now that the, the environments, as we mentioned earlier, COVID-19, there's a lot of moving pieces that are happening. Has this changed anything around your investments that you've been going forward? Have you kind of pulled back to just help the companies that you're in already? Have you still continued to look at the environment in a bigger picture and saying, hey, I got some deals out there? Uh, how have you kind of been scoping the change? Yeah, so the, the state of the markets have changed. Um, it, it hasn't caused me to, to pull back on investments. Um, you know, if a company is doing well in, in these tough times, it, it's even more telling and, you know, a prime time to, to kind of 
uh, pick and choose which ones are already showing that they have it in them to be successful, right? So it's kind of it's kind of testing out a lot of startups and um, and, and seeing what they're made of. And um, so I, I think uh, I think I am reading a lot that that VCs are kind of holding off and they're not doing as much investments and you know they'll do bigger check sizes to to things that they think are are safer. I'm, I'm looking at more in terms of still the, the smaller companies, smaller check sizes. Um, but, uh, you know, I'm, I'm looking for ones that are, are showing that they, they can make it through, obviously. Um, you know, the, the thing for me that's really changed, though, is uh, what I would do in case of an exit, right? So, so obviously, we're, we're in tough times. So I would probably only where I might have put maybe 50% of the money back into private equity investing, I might only put 30% and then look at other uh, types of asset classes to, to put funds into, right? So you're continuing to diversify, but at the end, you are look, still continuing to find I'm that putting, great deal. Yeah, I'm putting, the, I'm putting the same amount, if not, if not more. It's just, if, if I do you know, have a, a great payday, you know, I, obviously um, I wouldn't be putting as much out of that return back into private equity, but I'd still be increasing overall um, what I'm doing there. Okay, that's great. Uh, any suggestions or recommendations you'd offer a startup on how to connect or engage with local or country-based um, angel investors? So connecting with local country-based angels, um, yeah, referrals, referrals are generally welcome. Um, I think JP, you, you've mentioned that investors talk and um, certainly I, I noticed that as I grow my portfolio, um, I connect with the investors that are also backing those companies, um, reach out to them. They're open to, to any sorts of referrals. You know, I've sent opportunities their way to look at. Uh, they send some my way. You know, you, you can look at, um, you know, angel.co, angel list, right? And, and dig into it a little bit and, um, you know, see who's active in the market. You can look at uh, LinkedIn, do searches. Um, but, you know, at the end of the day, um, you know, attending events like yours. So, you know, I've gone to OPN pitch at events and have, have used that to, to network with people too. And um, startups should be looking at those types of opportunities when things open up, but also, uh, you know, what you're doing through your, your online and video to keep that going. Um, I had to tone down, I mentioned LinkedIn. I had to actually tone down my language on there before because I was being sent a pitch by strangers like every week. And, um, you know, I would get an ad, like they, they'd request an ad and then they send me their pitch, their pitch deck, right? And it'd be something that I've, like, I've never invested in before, I don't have any experience in, and they're like pushing to close right away. And so, you know, I had to tone that down. Um, I, do, I do read them when people do send them um, because I, you know, I want to better myself. I want to educate myself if it is an area that I don't have experience with. But, you know, I've never closed from an unsolicited message. There, there always has to be some sort of, um, you know, referral, but uh, like reference, right? So they may have an advisor that I'm familiar with, right? There has to be some sort of connection there to first uh, really get me interested. And that really comes down to helping you de-risk the business, right? Making sure that you're finding uh, the right variables that meet with your investment thesis, if you will. Uh, but yeah. it, it really does help. Uh, de-risk it when it's being referred by somebody you know, uh, they've gone through the diligence or they've even just looked at it uh, or it's a friend of theirs because that helps break down 50% of the effort uh, for you having to go in raw and figuring out what you want to do with this company. So uh, I, I completely uh, understand and agree from that. Is uh, from If you take this holistic view of all the companies you've invested in and companies that have been successful and the conversations that you're having with the CEOs and their teams, uh, when you've gone through all that, is there any underlying pieces that you find to be uh, really exceptional from, uh, from these businesses that you would share to other entrepreneurs and say, you know what, if, um, if you've got the gusto, you're going to win. Like, what is that thing that you find that really shapes a company and you found this across all your investments or uh, potential investments? Yes. The, the one underlying piece is the, it's the people and it's the effort that they put into it. So, you know, I mentioned that, um, you know, whether or not they've, they've done an exit, whether or not they have domain experience, whether or not they just have a lot of, a lot of passion and transferable skills. But at the end of the day, you know, 
they might have a great idea, but if they just, they don't put anything towards it, right? It's not going to go anywhere. So they, they have to have that drive. They have to realize that, you know, it's about sacrifice early on. You know, you're going to put in a lot of time to, to get things to hook. And, you know, once you, once you manage to get that perfect uh, product uh, market fit, then, then things be, may be a little bit easier and you can delegate some of that responsibility off. Um, but, you know, they're going to have to get outside of their comfort zone. They're going to have to learn things that they, they didn't know before like, and they had no interest in knowing before, right? So, you know, as a small, as a small team, you have to be familiar with many different areas of, of a business, right? So does that mean you kind of look at companies that the owner is maybe not fully background in so that they've got to hustle a little harder to learn it versus them coming from something they've been doing their whole life and starting a, a business? That, that, that's just it. Um, you know, I, I look at it much like if I was hiring an employee, right? So, you know, if it's an, if it's an entry level job, it's an important project that I'm being, that I'm putting them on. You know, have they worked in multiple different areas and demonstrated they have transferable skills they can apply there? And do they have the passion, determination, drive to make it happen? Um, if they do, then it's worth giving them a shot, right? And I'm, I'm sure you've seen it in business too. You, you know, you'll hire someone that, you know, they've, they've done the exact same project before. But you may also take a chance on someone because they just have the, the right mix and you, you think that they can pull it off. No, that's great. That's great advice. Uh, do you find that accelerators and incubators are good for your investments um, where they start out? You mentioned this earlier that you were jumping onto a bunch earlier on. Is that something you still get behind and, and do they really drive a lot of value to the ecosystem? Accelerators, incubators, I think are a, a good investment for startups. And, um, you know, they, they certainly help with things like solidifying revenue streams, business models, uh, make great connections, finding awesome advisors. Um, even getting investors through their, their demo days. Um, I do use it as a tool to um, find startups to invest in. Uh, obviously, they do a lot of vetting themselves for startups going into the program. So that reduces a lot of the time and uh, due diligence that needs to be done by investors, right? And so, you know, some of the notable ones that, that I look for in the, in the U.S. is you know, Alchemist Accelerator, I, I do uh, attend those. Uh, Techstars, uh, US and Canada, um, you know, I keep close eyes on, on those ones as well. And, um, you know, I just find it's, it's good, it's good kind of breeding ground to, to find a good startup, right? And uh, we wholeheartedly agree with that. I think that if um, it's a good, another de-risking factor, right? You can yep. grab the right team, board, and then you throw in that they've uh, attended one of these uh, Techstars or um, Alchemist, one of them, I think that they really bring a lot of value to helping the CEO actually focus their business and work through those different revenue streams, work through those uh, advisors that are going to get behind them, find those contacts in industry, get the right manufacturers in China or uh, around the world. So those, a lot of those things help really solidify that business to get them off the ground. So wholeheartedly agree with that. Uh, you mentioned earlier that you've got to get out and pitch in advance. Is this something that you highly recommend to a startup is earlier on? Should they get out and pitch everywhere they possibly can? Um, and then if you are pitching everywhere, uh, how do you protect your IP? And, and do you have any recommendations again, how you can help that startup kind of work their way through that ecosystem? Yeah, I, I believe that startup should, should pitch, um, you know, as, as often as possible for them to be comfortable doing it, right? One-on-one, -on -one, right? So if they need to go to events because it helps with building that, that confidence level where they can have conversations with, with people that maybe uh, they don't have much time to spare and you need to kind of hook them with that elevator pitch first, right? Um, I think that's very important. Uh, some people are more natural at public speaking and, and forming, uh, forming relationships like that than others. And so I think they have to be a judge of themselves and uh, know where they need to push themselves so that way they can fill the gap if that is an area that uh, they're a little bit weak in. Um, in terms of IP, I mean, it's who can do it the fastest, right? So, you know, I, I think a lot of companies, a lot of founders, they, they need to realize they're, they're not the only one with that idea, right? So they, have, they may look at and found that there's a gap in a market and they're trying to address it. Well, you know, there might be a thousand other people, right? So they need to, uh, they need to get rid of some of that, 
um, fear and um, guarding themselves and get out there because you know if they don't if they don't secure the funding, um, what's going to happen, right? So uh, it, it's a tough one to to deal with. Um, but uh, I feel that the more information they can share as possible, do you need to share like you know your source code with with potential investors? No. So. You know, but, you know, do you need to be able to talk about it in an intelligent way so that way they understand it? And, you know, if that investor happened to know other people who are doing something similar, they have to kind of um, remove that, uh, that fear from them and realize that th they just need the, the money and grow, right? They need to go and build it. No, that, that's, uh, that's great advice. And you're right. There's, uh, there's lots of events that are run. You got to find the ones that fit what you're trying to achieve, the people you want to meet. And um, even I think in time, you'll start to realize that you start to see in the ecosystem a lot of the same people. And the best part of that is, is that those people start to become interested in your business when they start to see you enough. They start to get interested in you. Uh, they see that you've got the hustle, you've got the drive. And when you're an early stage company, that's what helps. Those are the things you need. It's help supports you, gives you the energy to drive forward. Uh, so that's great advice. And you're right on the IP side. You kind of have to figure out what's the best way to protect yourself. Um, as you go forward, you don't have to be blasting out your, uh, your code, but you got to make sure that you're at least giving enough to, to hook people into your value. Um, so that's, that's great. Now on the government side, there's a lot of funding opportunities. Uh, is this something that you push your startups to, to dive into and to look at as another supporting feature? For, for government funding, um, I consider it good to go after. Uh, you know, if a company is eligible, then, then why not, right? And so you, you see a lot of startups that um, need the need the funding um, applying and going after it. And also you see some that they may not necessarily need it, but you know, they're foregoing um, doing an equity round um, because really their, their runway may be limited anyways. And so it's a great opportunity for them to, to take advantage and make sure that they're able to grow their company and they're able to get to the point where they can hire people, right? Um, and, and provide more to the economy. So um, I say go for it. Uh, you know, a couple of uh, companies that I'm involved in in, in the U.S. Um, have gone that route. Uh, one of them got uh, the Paycheck Protection Program and uh, then complemented that by going and getting a bank loan. And uh, they forego doing an equity, uh, equity round as a whole until, until next year. Um, so I, again, I'd say if you're eligible, go for it. Okay, no, that's great. Great to hear and good advice. Um, so now we've kind of gone through this big picture. We've run from the day one working with a startup to making the investment to getting information, how to promote yourself, how to market, uh, what you should talk about, places you should join to, to, to build up their community and get people interested in you. Uh, where, as an owner, where do you recommend startups go to learn a little bit more about term sheets, value, uh, investors, is there somewhere out there that you recommend where startups can get really informed about the ecosystem that they're part of? For, for learning about the, the ecosystem as a, a first time owner and, you know, doing um, raise, raising funds, um, you know, this is probably not going to be too helpful, but, you know, Google search, 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 right? So there, there's plenty of information out there, many articles where founders are, um, are sharing their journey. They may have gotten to the point where, um, you know, they've done some successful, um, successful rounds and they're giving back to the ecosystem by saying, you know what, this is what I did. It took, you know, sending out and calling like thousands of people over several years to get to that stage. There's infogra infographics out there which show like, you know, the average um, valuation for each sort of raise, uh, you know, whether it's pre-seed, seed or series A or whatnot. Um, and then also to align yourself with people that have done fundraising before from, you know, if you can, from pre-seed all the way through uh, an exit. And so uh, a lot of companies do this. They find, they find advisors um, that have successfully done those fundraises that, that have run companies themselves or, um, you know, they work in the finance sector and, uh, you know, they have access to family trusts and what have you. And they've, they've kind of seen it from the other side. Um, so. Once again, just do, do a lot of research, but um, find the right, right people too, to compliment you there. No, you make a very valid point that uh, you, you've got to do some research, but look for people that um, understand the space who may have exited before and try and see if you can do some work with them as well. They're going to be a very, uh, very helpful and, and bring a lot of value. 
there's obviously a lot of players in the ecosystem that can help from the Marses to the DMZ and other places that do have uh, information. Uh, so I think it's something that you can explore, but you're right, Google's a, a very powerful tool, so you should be able to find a lot of good material. So I think this kind of rounds up all of our questions. So the last question that I kind of want to end this with, um, Tim, is how do you see the North American early stage investment market looking in the next 12 months to three years? Where do you see it going through with this uh, COVID change and the world shifting? Is there anything that you think vertical wise is really going to stand out and that people should start looking at not only from investment, but maybe from starting companies and you know, where does that look in 12 months, but where does it specifically look in three years? So well, North American early stage investment markets, uh, you know, th things are changing rapidly. Um, I, I think I'm a, I'm a little bit hopeful on a couple fronts. Um, one of them is that, you know, I, I think that equity crowdfund will continue to rise in popularity. And um, hopefully the, the Canada market starts to resemble the U.S. market because it's been light years behind. And um, so that's why I've gone to the U.S. sites to kind of look for startups because there, there isn't much of selection or there isn't enough marketing um, for the platforms that exist. So um, I, do con I do think that it will continue to rise where people um, understand that they can make investments uh, in early stage companies and they don't need to be, they don't need to be accredited. There, there are ways that they can get involved, um, by writing smaller type of, uh, checks or, you know, credit card charges or what have you. Right. Um, it could be just a few hundred bucks, but I, I think this comes down to education. And I, I really think that in Canada, it's going to accelerate. Um, I look back uh, at, um, you know, my conversations with major banks, right? So I have a wealth manager over at uh, BMO and I had to educate him on startup investing, right? And I, I swear I was the first one out of his clients that wanted to log business shares into small business shares into my RRSP. And to work through that process was like a four to six month process and so that, that tells me that not a lot of people are taking advantage of that. I had, to, I had interesting conversations with an accountant about the lifetime capital gains exemption in Canada, which is fantastic. It's just no one seems to know about it. So I'm hoping that, you know, a, a lot of these great programs that we do have, which reduce tax burdens on, on investments, um, people realize are at their disposal and they take advantage of it, right? Um, I'm, in terms of verticals, I'm still monitoring the impact of COVID-19. Obviously, I don't think we, we know what the, the total impact is. It's probably going to be months out until we, we see the repercussions because it's hitting us in, in waves, right? Um, med tech is obviously an area of great interest. Um, I haven't made the leap forward. A couple of the companies in my portfolio have made uh, pivots in that direction where one's using their mobile tech to get involved in contact tracing, another is doing uh, 3D printing of personal protective equipment. So, you know, by necessity, I've sort of, I'm learning more about it, right? Because the companies in my portfolio are making those changes. Um, but obviously it's an area of, of interest and I'm continuing to monitor. I think localization, shortening of supply chains is uh, gonna be very intriguing what, what happens on that front, uh, the impact on globalization, right? Um, but the overall reality is that a lot of startups will fail over the next couple of years. And yet there's going to be a surge of new ones coming forward. So I, I think really the, the thing that's got me most excited is looking at um, tools that are increasing the probability that startups succeed. And, uh, you know, that's where I'm kind of honing in on and I'm looking, uh, looking into is who's making things available that will um, cut back on the, the, the fail rate of startups. No, that's some, uh, that was putting your space helmet on and giving us some uh, awesome forward thinking. So, Tim, I want to thank you very much today for, for joining us and sharing your insights. Uh, they were uh, incredible. And I think um, I'm going to leave it with you to give us your one last thought about one recommendation that you would give to a new startup that's joining into the economy or into the uh, ecosystem. What's one thing you would tell them or any startup uh, on how to uh, build success? Be 100% committed. That, that's it. So, you know, go, go with it. Be committed. I love it. You're right. Be committed. Well, we're all committed to uh, having a, a great talk today. Thank you very much for that, Tim. 
uh, well-rounded. I think we, uh, we got everything that we were looking for. I appreciate all your time, all your effort, and everything you do in the uh, ecosystem. Have a fantastic day, and thank you, everybody, for joining us. And uh, I think the questions, uh, hopefully, we're able to appeal to the audience, and uh, we're going to get back to you over the next uh, week or so with the edits when we send this out. Thanks, JP. I appreciate it. You bet. Thank you very much.